to come here. Okay. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about computational screening. It's also the, the first talk this morning. But in this case, I will focus on solar energy uh, materials. So uh, some of the sort of ideas behind computational screening, of course, you have already heard about that. But I've just put three points here. The first one is, what's actually the problem that you want to solve? And uh, so what are the properties of the beam material for whatever application that you have, that you have in mind? And in order to, uh, uh, to then get on any further, you need to know what we can actually compute which is relevant for this, for this material. And finally, since the uh, number of, of possible materials is so huge, you usually have to limit somehow yourself to a part of material space. And I think these are sort of the main, the main components that I'm also going to, to address. The problem that I'm going to focus on is so-called light-induced uh, water splitting. So the idea there is to take uh, light from the sun, make electron hole pairs, and use those to split uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen. In this case, with a tandem cell, where you have two semiconductors, and uh, one taking the, the, the uh, uh, high energy part of the solar spectrum, the other the low energy uh, part, and the reason that you do this is because of uh, efficiency. It's much more efficient than having a simple material. So uh, why do we want to do this? We want to produce hydrogen as a fuel, fuel to, uh, to save the world. <clears throat> and some way, I'm not even kidding. This is a really serious problem with the, with the use of fuels. So we have to do something in the not too distant future. So the devices that people work with now are really quite complicated, and I'm not going to go into any details because you are not all that interested in water splitting, but the fact that, that, that we have these two semiconductors, and then we probably have to protect them from the water with some protection layers, and we also need some catalysts to get the, the, the chemical reactions running. And it turns out that some of these components we actually know how to, how to do. But one real challenge is what should be the large band gap semiconductor? Silicon will work pretty well as the low band gap one because the optimal band gap is around 1.1 eV. But the large band gap one should be around 1.8 eV. And that's the material that we would like to, to find. So uh, I will discuss three different approaches. To the, uh, to the question about the material space. One is to map out a particular class of materials, and I'll look at the perovskites. The other one is to focus on known materials, as we've also heard uh, earlier today from the ICSD. And uh, at the last point is to take a look at machine learning and how to use that to, to guide the search in, in material space. Um, we have earlier done some work on, on oxides and oxynitrides, uh, perovskites, and uh, uh, they have, they, they, for many reasons, they were not optimal for, for this application here. One thing was that the position of the valence band maximum was too low, and that's something that sulfides generally do, uh, do better. <clears throat> so we decided in this project to concentrate on sulfide uh, perovskites, and then we have a screening funnel where we go through different properties. And uh, as the question be before, I think, about getting TC, what, what, which order should one do the different uh, screening steps is also, of course, to have more demanding calculations at the end so that you do not have to do that many because you've actually discarded many of the materials. So the way that we approach this is that we take 53 different metal atoms so we have A, B as three, A here and B there. And then as an initial screening, 
we take a small 5 actin unit cell, which is allowed to distort, and then see how many of these were in fact semiconductor. So can they have a gap at, at all? Could I take, excuse me, a bit of water here? So after this step, where we've identified these, we look up in the ICSD, one of the most common structures for ABS3 materials. And then we simply pick the six most common ones, and then we investigate these materials in all the six different structures. Um, in this way, we can, these are the different structures for a given material. We can calculate the, uh, the binding energy, the heat of formation, and we can calculate the band gap, which is shown here. And here you can see an example where we have different structures with, with, with different energies, but then we have a point here, which is just as Stevano talked about, the convex hull. So this is the energy you get by combining binary components in the most efficient way. So in this way, you can see that the convex hull is more stable, so this material will not work. It will be unstable. And we have these error bars on that we, that we get from, from using our meter B for functionals, so that we have an estimate of the error bar on the, uh, on the predicted energies. In some, in some cases, like over here, you see the convex hull is up there, so it might be stable, but you can see that there are several different crystal structures that we cannot really distinguish between. And uh, then it's quite important what the band gap is for these different structures. Because if you have a competing structure where you just get a little bit of that into your compound and it's metallic, then it's, it's terrible. But if it has a fairly high band gap, it might not be that important for the performance of the material. But these are the kind of details you have to go into if you really want to, to, to I think, find new uh, usable materials. Then we can calculate the band gaps. Again, here are the different materials, and the different symbols denote the band gaps calculated for the different uh, structures. So we can focus on this green window, which is relevant for water splitting around 2 EV for the band gap, and then we also actually collect materials that could be relevant for photovoltaics with, with a band gap around 1 EV. Uh, we calculate the band gaps with GLLB, which includes the derivative dis discontinuity and therefore gets a much better estimate of the band gap than, than standard, say, PV, DFT. Uh, we also try to address mobility by calculating this, the effective masses. That's, of course, not in any way a a complete uh, description, but it's better than nothing. And then we concentrate on, here you have the electron and hole masses on the materials where, the, where, where you can find masses which are below, below one uh, electron mass. The last step, uh, which, is, which is maybe the most uh, say unusual one here, is that we try to study the defect properties. And the way we do that is by looking at the density of states if we create vacancies. And what is important here is if the vacancies will introduce states in the band gap, as you see here, because this might be scattering centers which will, which will destroy the, uh, the properties of the, uh, of the material. So uh, these materials, which we call defect sensitive, or they're called defect sensitive, we will then remove from the, from the screening uh, procedure. So, uh, in the end, we end up with, in this case, like 15 different, different candidates of these, uh, of these sulfides. And uh, then, as it was also discussed before, then what do you do? Luckily, we have some, some experimental colleagues nearby that are exactly interested in, uh, in water splitting and these kinds of materials. And, uh, uh, we discussed with them that they should try to look at land for the yttrium sulfide as, as a candidate. And they've done that, and here is the, uh, the x-ray result when they synthesized, and uh, you, it's not intended that you look at any, any particular things here, except that the conclusion is that the material does actually have the predicted uh, crystal structure. Also, the band gap is around uh, 2 EV, but, uh, as measured here, by spectroscopic ellipsometry, 
And finally, the photoluminescence shows a nice uh, peak close to the band gap, uh, some indirect indication that you don't have too many problems with, with states in, in, in the band gap. So uh, at the moment, they are trying to actually incorporate this material in, in a water splitting device. Uh, that's not, not easy, but we'll have to see what, what comes out of this. How am I doing on time? Good, okay. So uh, there are of course many limitations in this approach. We only have a particular composition, we only have few structures. We do not give a very accurate calculation of the, of the band gap. The mobility is only addressed by effective masses. Defects we only consider only neutral, only consider neutral vacancies and so on. So there, there, there's room for lots of improvement, but still in the end, if we, we started out with something like 3,000 materials, and we actually end up with a short list of, of 15, so you have a, a huge reduction in the, in the number of materials that you have to worry about. So uh, a different approach than looking at a particular class of materials is to take a starting point in some of the available databases. And what we have done here is to uh, start with the ICSD as they are already calculated within the database, the OQMD. So that has a lot of advantages. One of the most difficult I issues to address is the stability, but these materials have actually been synthesized. So that's at least not the, the major point for a start. And also, and also some of the properties have already been calculated within the OQMD, so that's a way to speed up the, uh, the, the search to, to use that. The first thing we, we address here is the abundance of the elements and the question of whether you have a monopoly market for these uh, elements. If these are meant for as energy materials that should save the world, they will have to be used at very large scale. And that's a reason to only focus on elements which are uh, expected to be, to be uh, available at a, at, a reasonable, at a reasonable cost. So uh, here is, a, a, so here is the, the screening funnel where we start by picking out these, these elements and then we get something like 7,000 uh, materials. Then uh, the band gap with PBE is already calculated in the, uh, in the OQMD. So we can use that to do a pre-screening of the materials and say we'll only focus the, on the ones which are known to be semiconducting and to have a band gap less than, than, uh, than 2 EV. Since it, uh, PV is severely underestimating the band gap, you would expect that, that you wouldn't, in this case, miss materials which actually have, say, 2, 3 EV of band gap in, in reality. So this brings down the number to around 1,600 uh, materials. Then we calculate the band gap with GLLB, and here you can see, as expected, the connection between the GLLB and the, uh, and the PBE band gap. It's somewhat, uh, it's somewhat larger, and we can focus on the region which is relevant for water splitting and the region uh, relevant for photovoltaics. Then we, as before, we can calculate the effective masses, and here you see below this curve the ones which the fraction that actually uh, obeys this cri criterion. And again, the same approach with the defect sensitivity, and in this way we end up with 74 uh, candidate materials. So out of the, of the uh, whole of ICSD, this is the uh, rather small class of materials that we, that we find. And so we have a long list of the properties of these materials. Uh, there are many uh, known materials, of course, uh, which was also addressed by Stefano. I mean, you have to check and see, does it actually uh, uh, behave in the way that you expect for materials which have been investigated as uh, solar energy materials? And then we can point to some particularly interesting candidates. And for example, this strontium sulfide is another material that is now being uh, experimentally uh, investigated uh, to see how it will how it will perform. So uh, at, at the
the end here, I'll say something about uh, some, of the, uh, some of the attempts that, that, that we have in, in using machine learning. Of course, there are many ways of, of doing machine learning, different fingerprints representing your materials, different doing kernel regression, neural networks, and so on. The two uh, questions that I'm going to ask, ask here is, can we predict material properties without knowing where the atoms are? The point here is that the kind of screenings that I've been talking about, we mostly use uh, uh, standard density functional theory calculations. And what's really time consuming is to do the structure optimizations for all these new materials. But the point is, we, if we make a machine that can predict, say, the stability and the band gap for a material, if we know where the atoms are, it's no help, because it means that we have to do the DFT calculation first in order to, to, uh, to find the positions, and then, then uh, we don't need the machine. Um, another question is, if we're considering very large material spaces, then actually even though you might have an efficient machine, it's not possible for the machine to run through all the combinations. If you have 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 15 different materials, this is not possible. So we will need some ways of directly identifying interesting candidates instead of just trying out. I'm sorry here, I just need more. Yeah. I put it there. Okay. Good. Thanks. Now, I only have one example for this, uh, not related to bulk materials but to organic solar cells where we are interested in some it's what's called PCBM-based blended polymer solar cells. I've written down here what PCBM means because I will not be able to remember it, so if you asked about it, it's here. Uh, the way this works is that, that, again, you generate electron hole pairs, and then crucial, I'm not going to in, into any, any kind of details here, the pop, I think the main part is the the fun with the machine learning, and then the uh, crucial quantities that you are after is the position of this Lubu level at the acceptor so that you can transfer the electron and what the band gap is for the, for the light absorption. And we are looking into a class of donor acceptor molecules where you have different possible acceptors, different possible donors, say backbones, and then you have different side chains here indicated X and Y, which can have uh, a number of different possibilities. So in total, this space will be something like 10 to the 14 different molecules in principle. So uh, we have done b 3 lib calculation for about 4,000 of these, but you would not like to, to go into to, uh, uh, doing this to a, to a much larger extent. And uh, you can do machine learning on this uh, using all the, the atomic coordinates of the, of the uh, molecules using some of the standard fingerprints, and it works very nicely. But again, how do you know the coordinates for a molecule that you haven't calculated? So the approach that, that we have taken here is to represent the molecules by strings or rather grammatical production rules. So that, uh, I talked about that you had a, 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 an acceptor and a donor part and you had different side groups and that's turned into a string that can be produced with some particular grammatical rules. So in this case we do not have any specification of the atomic coordinates and let me, let me say that the, the end result, if you do this, instead of using the coordinates, is that you're doing predictions of the band gap maybe 40% maybe, uh, worse. Okay, so it's better to have the coordinates, but it's not, it's not that crucial. Uh, this kind of approach has been used uh, uh, in a Spurogusic group, also using smiles for some other molecules. So, so this was a question of how do we represent our systems without in this case, without any, any atomic coordinates. The other point was how do we make predictions without running through, thanks, without running through all the different combinations. And one way of doing this is this variational autoencoder where you train a neural network 
so that you have an input, in this case, the strings, and then the neural network would map this into a much lower dimensional vector space. In this case, it's a, in our case here, it's a 32 dimensional vector space. And the way that this is trained is so that you can optimally uh, reproduce again in the output the input string. So you're trying to compress the information into a vector space and then out again. So that you, can, so that you don't lose very much information by doing this. And one of the advantages is that then you can move around in this 32 dimensional vector space. It's still large, but because it's a vector space, you can also do things like taking gradients and stuff like that to actually optimize your searches. So just to show uh, one result for this uh, latent space is if you are doing a principal component analysis, then you, these are the first two components of this 32 dimensional space. And here you can see the data points from the training set. But what you can also see is that if we now, from the data set, have some interesting molecules with appropriate LUMO values and homolumo gaps, they are indicated by the yellow points. So the point is now that you can actually move now around, you train another neural networks network to produce the numbers uh, for, the, for, the, for the band gaps and for the LUMO, you train that on this space, and then you can make, uh, move around in the relevant part of space and then suggest new molecules without having to run through billions and billions of molecules. And you can see the, ex the result here, that this is the training set and this is the rel relevant region of the, uh, in this case, the obstacle band gap and the LUMO energy. And here we have predicted 100 new molecules by this approach. And you can see that now they, they, they lie uh, closely in the, in the region that we're interested in. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of a test. This is in no way uh, uh, useful at the moment for these uh, solar cells. But I think it's, it's, it's fun to see these, these different uh, approaches that can be uh, uh, used for, for up finding, uh, finding materials. So, uh, at the end, some pretty naive uh, considerations when we move to the exascale. I mean, we can simply do uh, much more uh, in terms of the computer power. We can screen more different materials. We can do better calculations. We can calculate new properties, which are much more demanding than what we can do today. A trivial point that I'd like to make you at the end is, however, when we will be able to do this, we might be able to calculate not a thousand materials, but a million materials or a billion. But if what you're seeking for is 1% of these, you will actually end up with very many candidates, and you cannot go to the experimentalists with 10,000 candidates and say, could you please try that out? So I think a main very important challenge will be to find better and more descriptors which are relevant for the real material properties so that one can really narrow down the materials that, that uh, are interesting to investigate further. And here are some of the people that have done this. In particular, Corina Kuha and Monish Pandey have done the, uh, the uh, uh, two screening studies of the, of the uh, sulfur perovskites and the ICSD uh, OQMD part. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs>